Where are you going, Holmes? Have you been invited somewhere? We have been invited, Watson. We have? Where to? To the Baker Street Irregulars' annual dinner. They sent us an invitation. It is on the table. A dinner? How could those street urchins afford anything like that? I can't understand your interest in them, Holmes. They're dirty. They wouldn't hesitate to steal your wallet. They... Watson, you should be excited. It is a secret dinner. Its location changes every year. Read the menu. Sounds mouth-watering. All right. We, the secret police of Baker Street, invite you, Sherlock Holmes, and Dr. Watson to our annual dinner. Menu, entree, frozen rathead salad. Is, is this a joke? Not at all. Pray continue. Main course, sow's udder in Danny Nutcracker's way. Ah, oh, sounds disgusting, Holmes. Hedgehog goulash. Street turnips in homemade juice. And it goes on. Ah, I can hear them on the stairs now. Oh, we can't go there. We can't eat that. Watson, you'll hurt the feelings of those poor children. We have to go. Oh, Mr Holmes. It is fine, Mrs Hudson. Mr Holmes. Wiggins, Dr Watson is getting ready. He will be delighted to join us. You don't look well, my young man. Is there something wrong? Don't tell me the dinner is cancelled. Mr. Holmes, it's my brother Leighton. He's in a prison cell. They say he's killed two men. You have to help us, Mr. Holmes, because I know he didn't do it. Where is he now? From what I've heard, they took him to the yard and they gave him a good beating already. You know what they're like. They'll hang him. They won't look any further. Holmes, we have to help him. Well, and forget about the dinner. Wiggins, I'll take the case. You're fantastic, Mr. Holmes. I'll be waiting for you at the crime scene. You'll be there, right? It's on Half Moon Street in Whitechapel. Very well. Holmes, poor little Wiggins needs our help. Uh, please, gentlemen, leave the scene now. Oh, Mr. Holmes, is that you? Uh, good evening, uh, Constable... Constable Marrow. I was here with Inspector Aberline during the Ripper case, Mr. Holmes, back in 88. But then this is nothing like that case. With this one, we've got the murderer, the weapon and the statements which speak for themselves. Of course, Marrow. But you know that appearances can sometimes be deceiving. Who were the victims? The two men here, both shot. The stab fellow was Brian Vercotti, a well-known ruffian. The other, Kenneth Butler, a jeweller by trade. Uh, you spoke of statements. You have witnesses? Well, I was there, so I gave my own statement. And then there were two other witnesses who said they saw the killer Chapman. Mr. Turner, a gentleman who lives in that flat over there. And Polly Powell, a flower seller who was over at the far side of the street. So, Constable Marrow, I should be delighted to hear your testimony. I was standing at the north side of Half Moon Street. That was the side that you came from. But you would have been unable to observe this part of the street, where we are standing now. That is correct. But I saw the two victims slowly enter Half Moon Street, and then shortly after, the fireworks started. A few minutes after that, the fellow Chapman rushed towards me and ran into Half Moon Street. Mm, please continue. I didn't pay attention, but suddenly I heard a woman's cries and police whistles on the other side of Half Moon Street. I rushed over there and I saw the two dead bodies on the ground. When I reached Whitechapel Street, I saw Leighton Chapman. He'd been caught by two police constables. 
Did you hear the shots? I didn't hear any shots. The fireworks were all over the sky. They were so loud I couldn't hear anything else. What were the fireworks in honour of, uh, Constable? Well, uh, today's Queen Victoria's birthday, Mr. Holmes. Ah, uh, yes, I appear to have lost track of the days. It is May now, of course. The Constable Marrow, what else caught your attention while you were running through Half Moon Street? I saw nothing but rats, and I took the time to light every corner with my lamp. Did you happen to look up at Mr. Turner's window when you were on Half Moon Street at that time? Yes, I saw that the window was open, but no one was there. It was dark in the room. Constable, your statements have been of great value to me. He tried to stop the bleeding with his hand. Death was not instant. The bullet penetrated his stomach, a dreadful wound. A tattoo from Westgate Prison. Vicotti must have done some time there. Brian Vercotti suffered greatly. What a terrible way to die. The bullet struck his head. This man didn't stand a chance. This is an ordinary key. I wonder what kind of door it opens. A piece of wood that has stuck between the cobblestones. Let us take a closer look. Hmm. This shard of wood is quite new. Good evening, Mr. Turner. Oh, I, I heard Constable Marrow reply to you as Mr. Holmes. Are you that detective, gentlemen? I've heard of you. Uh, and, well, I know things. Things about this evening. Excellent. Might we hear your story? Could you tell us everything that you may have seen or heard? Uh, I was already in bed when the fireworks started. A few moments after, I clearly heard two gunshots from outside. Please continue. Uh, I quickly got up and I grabbed the lamp from my nightstand and I rushed towards the window. I looked down and I saw two bodies. And there was a man with a gun who was standing nearby. Where exactly? Well, near this body. Did he notice you? I don't think so. He rushed towards Whitechapel Street without looking around. Mr. Turner, did you see anyone else in the street? No, I saw no one but that man. The murderer. The fellow they caught. Were the two shots you heard consecutive? Yes, th there was a very short pause between them, and, and, and they sounded different somehow. It seemed to me that the second shot was louder than the first. That is an interesting comment. Mr. Turner, what were your actions after you stepped up to the window? I was afraid that the man with a gun might return, so I stayed close to the window till I saw the policeman coming in the half-moon from Whitechapel. Then I walked out to tell them everything I saw.
You have helped us a great deal, Mr. Turner. Mrs. Powell? What do you want? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm assisting the police with their investigation of the crime that took place this evening. Well, I've already gave my testimony, but very well. Could you tell us everything that you may have seen or heard? Yes, yes. I was selling my flowers as usual, and then the fireworks began, in honour of Queen Victoria. I enjoyed those. But then, all of a sudden, a young lad ran out of Half Moon Street and stopped just by me. He had a gun in his hand. He was like a ghost, and all covered in blood. It was dark, but I could see him, because of the flashes from the fireworks. And then? I screamed as loud as I could. I knew that a policeman should be on duty in the vicinity. He had no time to escape. Two constables got him. Then another constable came out from the very same street, and I heard him talking of a horrible murder. Mrs. Powell, did you hear the gunshots? I'm not sure. You know, what with the fireworks? Did you see anyone else leaving Half Moon Street, prior to or at the time of the crime? No, sir. I did not. Even with all the fireworks, I was very attentive, as I'm always on the lookout for customers. My thanks to you, Mrs. Powell. Mr. Holmes, did you see my brother at Scotland Yard? Is he all right? Mr. Turner, you have stated that you remained close by your window after the crime, is that correct? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. I stayed at my window until the policeman arrived to examine the dead bodies. That is very interesting, Mr. Turner. Constable Marrow stated that he did not see anyone at the window when he was running through Half Moon Street. Oh, oh, well, I think Constable Marrow and me, we might have been distracted by the whistles and shouts coming from Whitechapel. We could have missed each other somehow. Do you understand what I mean? It was a bit of a stressful moment to tell you the truth, sir. Allow me to form my own theories, Mr. Turner. Would you mind showing me the view that you had from your window? Uh, not, not at all, Mr. Holmes. Please, follow me. Mr. Turner appears to live very modestly. This fire is dying out. It was last tended to over an hour ago. The papers are almost entirely burned. I am unable to see what's written here. These words are illegible. The papers were thrown into the fire just a short while ago. The books on this shelf are in a mess. 
It looks as though Mr. Turner was trying to find something in a hurry here a short while ago. A perfect match. So, Mr. Turner broke his stick when it became stuck between the cobblestones. He did not mention that he was so near to the victims. Mr. Turner was roused from his bed by the sound of gunshots. This kitchen knife is quite sharp. There are pieces of shredded paper scattered over the table. This kitchen knife was used to cut the paper. So, that's the view Mr. Turner had when he opened the window. The dead body of Kenneth Butler. Brian Vercotti's contorted corpse. Mr. Turner had a perfect view of the crime scene. He saw the bodies clearly and Leighton Chapman standing over them. So Mr. Turner used a book to hide an object that he found on Kenneth Butler's body. The question is, what did he find? I can see prints from greasy fingers upon the cover of this book. Let us take a closer look. Well now, what a find, a precious jewel concealed inside a book. A bracelet with a unique ram's head design, a distinctive feature of ancient Grecian artifacts, probably of the Hellenistic era. Mr. Turner, how would it be possible for a man of advanced years, such as yourself, to rush from his bed to the window in a matter of seconds, as you have stated? Well, uh, I'm, I'm able to move very quickly, despite my age, and when the situation requires it, Mr. Holmes. I highly doubt that, Mr. Turner. I observe that you suffer a severe limp due to your injured right leg. It would have taken at least 10 seconds for you to approach the window. That means you could have easily missed something or someone in Half Moon Street during that time. You're right, Mr. Holmes. I could have missed something. But it did seem to me that everything happened so quickly. Oh, time can pull tricks on you. And what of everything else that you told us? Mr. Turner, it is vital that we have your complete and true statement. Mr. Holmes, I do assure you that the other things I said were most sincere.
Mr. Turner, you were not sincere with me. Not then, and not now. But, but, but Mr. Holmes... This, Mr. Turner, does not look like anything that a poor man might possess. It is worth more than the home that you live in. I, I can explain. No, merely correct me if I am wrong. You saw Leighton Chapman through the window, but you also noticed a glittering object on the ground, this precious jewel. You walked down and took the bracelet from the body of Kenneth Butler, and when you heard the whistles, you hurried away. That broke your walking stick. It caught fast between the cobbles. Constable Marrow was unable to see you in the window as you were climbing up the stairs on your way back to your flat. Upon returning home, you hid the precious jewel inside a book. Mr. Holmes, please don't send me to prison. I didn't do anything bad. I'm just a poor man. When I chanced upon the bracelet, I saw it as an opportunity to make a little money. I was desperate. I only took the bracelet, that's all I swear. You made a mistake by lying to me. But you are not a criminal. I believe that. Although I must return this bracelet to its rightful owner. Mr. Holmes, whatever brings you here so late at night? I am interested in the case of young Leighton Chapman. He was arrested earlier this evening and accused of a double murder. I beg your pardon? That case is quite clear to the police. Or are there any new facts that we don't know about? <laughs> Who knows, Inspector? Look, you are free to investigate, of course, Mr. Holmes. Chapman was arrested with a revolver in his possession which you can find in the evidence room. The suspect himself is in custody. Did you find anything else on his person? A few personal belongings. Nothing particular, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Lestrade. So this is the gun that Leighton was holding when he was caught by the police. It is a Webley revolver, a reliable weapon. It seems as though the shells were not removed from the cylinder. It seems... Two out of the six shells have been fired. There were two shots. A cheap watch, bought with his own money, no doubt. These cigarettes are filled with cheap tobacco. Nothing interesting. Please escort this suspect for interrogation. Good evening, Mr. Chapman. Who are you? I've got nothing to say. It's all a mistake. Calm down, Leighton. I have come here to help you. To find out if you truly are innocent, as your younger brother Wiggins has told me. My brother? You know him? Then that means you're... Sherlock Holmes. Oh, blimey. All right, Mr. Holmes. I'll tell you everything. Good. Tell me your account of what happened. I left my work, and I hurried up to see the fireworks in Whitechapel. I was late, so I decided to cut through Half Moon Street. I saw the first fireworks light up in the sky. I bumped into a constable on a corner before entering Half Moon. And then suddenly, what with all the firework flare, I saw two men... They were both lying flat in the middle of the street. I stopped where I was. 
I, I thought about turning back to the police, but as I was thinking of that, I saw a fur person. He was leaning over the body that was furthest from me. The second I saw him, he raised his head and he stared at me. In a flash, I saw his gun, but he made a dash for it instead and he escaped through Whitechapel Street. So you might still have had time to return to the constable. I panicked. I, I didn't know what to do. Anyway, I, I approached the bodies just to see if they were still alive. I saw that one had blood pumping out of his stomach. He was dying. It was horrible. The second one was already dead. He had a hole in his head. He was holding a gun in his hand, though. I took it, and then I followed the third man. Interesting. Pray continue. I turned a corner, and I saw the man standing in the middle of the street. He seemed to be in some, some sort of panic. And then, Mr. Holmes, something strange happened. I told the police and they laughed at what I said, but I swear to you, my words are true. I started running towards him. But then I was blinded by a flash. It was so bright that I hardly saw anything for a good dozen seconds. But I kept running forward. As I arrived in Whitechapel, I heard a woman screaming. And then I was caught by the police. But there wasn't a trace of that man. Of course, then they found a gun and all that blood. I couldn't see the murderer escaping and all that mess. Perhaps I was still half-blinded at that moment. A thrilling account, my young man. Leighton, are you able to describe the person whom you saw standing in Half Moon Street? Well, I wasn't able to see his face at all. It was too dark, and he was too far away. I could see his silhouette. Hmm, and what about that? Nothing so special. He was wearing a jacket. He was quite average in, in size and his weight. I see. Was there anything else that struck you at the time? No. But perhaps... It's strange, but... I can't remember the sound of his footsteps as he was running away. Perhaps it was because of the fireworks or, or the surprise of me seeing him. Leighton, I confess I am puzzled. Why should a young lad like you take a gun from the hands of a dead man and set off in pursuit of a probable killer? I know. I keep wondering that, but at the time it was, it was like a reflex. A criminal ought to be arrested, and he was armed. You were willing to risk your life. That was a little foolish, unless you wanted revenge. No, Mr. Holmes. I was just being brave and stupid. I'm sure that you were, but I believe that you may have recognized one of the victims, Brian Vercotti. You knew that gentleman well, did you not? How? However could you know that? You have a typical tattoo of the Westgate Brotherhood upon your hand. I observed exactly the same mark upon Mr. Vercotti. You came to know him from your sharing a past prison sentence. Am I correct, Mr. Chapman? Oh, God. You're right, Mr. Holmes. Would you tell me a little about Brian Vercotti? We were convicted for a robbery. Once in prison, both of us joined one of these fraternities. During that year, we tried to help each other out, you know? Now, you were quite young then, I believe. Yes, Mr. Holmes, we were. We'd only stolen a pound of meat. After we were released and when I saw what my little brother had become, I decided to work towards living an honest life. And Vercotti? He had a hard time. His sister had died in a Whitechapel dispensary while he was in prison. He had no family anymore. Our paths split. He fell back into crime. 
So you lost him? Yes. And for around two years, I heard no news of him at all. We shall see you soon, young man. Here it is. I need to continue my research in my archives. Here it is. One of the victims, Kenneth Butler, was involved in the story of the stolen Hellenistic treasures. A visit to his pawn shop should tell me more. Mr. Butler's key matches the lock perfectly. Crampons and a sharp ice axe would only be brought here by a mountaineer. A flare pistol. Perhaps it was pawned by a destitute sailor. The ram's heads. This necklace belongs to the five rams of Mytilene collection. Interesting. That means that Kenneth Butler owned a part of this collection all this time, ten years after the theft. It looks as though Mr. Butler kept a careful record of his operations.
What's up with you, lad? What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for my brother to be released. Your brother? The one that you caught, beat up and imprisoned. Ah, the murderer. He ain't killed no one, copper. Watch your mouth, lad, else you'll be joining that worthless brother of yours. I am unable to see any higher. I need to find something to lift my lamp. This should be useful. Nothing interesting here. Nothing interesting here. This is most definitely a bullet hole. The brick cracks are fresh. Watson, there was a third shot fired in this street. Constable Marrow, I would value your assistance in this investigation. It would be my pleasure, Mr. Holmes. I would like to make sure that there are no places in Half Moon Street where a man could hide while you were running through it with your lamp. All right, Mr. Holmes, what should I do? Take your lamp and start walking, just as you did before, and try to find me. Understood. I can see you very well, Mr. Holmes. All right, Constable. Let's try again. I'll find another place to hide.
Here you are, Mr. Holmes. All right, Constable. Let's try again. I'll find another place to hide. Mr. Holmes, it wasn't difficult to find you at all. It is obvious now. No one could escape Constable Marrow's lamp while hiding in the street. These tools are exactly what I need to climb the wall. This is exactly what we need in order to imitate the flash of the fireworks. Why are you looking at me all the time like that? I'm just watching you, lad. I never know what to expect from people like you. People like me? Yes, street beggars and thieves. I ain't a thief. Oh, no. Then where did you get whatever it is that you're gnawing on? I very much doubt that you bought it. What ain't seen can't hardly be stolen. Constable Marrow, Watson, I would like to perform another kind of reenactment with your help. I'm listening, Mr. Holmes. I want to check if Leighton's testimony can be trusted, if someone could vanish into thin air at a specific moment. But, Holmes, I don't see how. I am going to be the mysterious gentleman whom Leighton followed. I will stand exactly where he saw him before he was blinded by the flash. Watson. You will be Leighton. When I fire the signal flare, you should start to chase me. I understand, Holmes. You, Constable Marrow, just play your part and do exactly as you did. Just, please, wait five seconds after the signal flare. I doubt that Polly Powell would have screamed any earlier. As you say, Mr. Holmes. Let us begin, then. Catch me if you can. This wall is cast in shadow. It would be difficult to see anyone scaling it. barely see anything. Holmes? Are you there? 
Where is he? My God, a man can't just disappear like that. Holmes? Holmes? Where are you? I cannot see you, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson, it seems that Mr. Holmes has disappeared. Don't worry, gentlemen. I am up here, above your heads. How on earth did you get up there, Holmes? I am using crampons and a climbing axe, although the person we are looking for did not leave any traces of such tools. Constable, is there any way to get to the top of this building? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I can show you. The door to the building can be found from Whitechapel Street. Gentlemen, I am on my way down. A cluster of thick black threads. They're unusually strong. I should examine them under the microscope. It's empty. Someone broke through the window to get inside the attic, but in his haste he ripped his jacket These shards of glass are from the window above. We can conclude that the person whom Leighton saw climbed up the wall, broke into the attic window and escaped through the hatch. Hello, Toby. All you need now is a shawl and a mop cap, and you could be Mrs. Hudson's younger sister. Let us take a closer look. It is not a thread, but a hair. I very much doubt that it is human. I need to compare this sample with a human hair and a horse hair. Hmm, a shaving brush is usually made from horse hair. Watson, uh, could you please pass me your shaving brush? Here you are. Uh, Watson, look, what's outside the window? Well, I don't see anything. Ouch! Holmes! Oh, don't make such a fuss. One little hair. This is a most unusual hair. Human hair is significantly thinner than the black sample. The horse hair is thinner than the hair that we found. So, this black hair belongs to an animal and it is larger than a horse. A hair from a large and exotic animal.
I'm always wondering what's on your mind, Holmes. Wiggins, my lad, what are you doing here? You'd best be leaving and be quick about it. I've done nothing wrong. You'd learn more by watching Mr. Holmes. He knows exactly what he's doing. Not like you. Oi, watch your tongue. Mr. Holmes? We have good news for you, Wiggins. The investigation has proven very interesting so far. We found facts and details that confirm your brother's innocence. I knew it, Mr. Holmes. But for now, Wiggins, we need your help. Anything you like, Gov. I need you to locate a circus that has stopped over in London. It needs to have disposed of at least one exotic animal, a very large one. You can count on me, Mr. Holmes. I do hope that those children don't get into trouble, Holmes. Don't worry, Watson. I predict some news in... seven seconds. Mr. Holmes, we found it! Here it is! And this is a young Indian elephant, the highlight of the show. Duval Brothers, a well-known travelling circus, that is currently stopped in London. I believe that is exactly the type of circus we are looking for. I'll pay it a visit. Aye, you! Stop right there! Good morning, sir. Pardon me, but why am I not allowed to walk around here? Because it's private. Well, I only wanted to meet the artistes. Hmm? You're wanting to apply for... Nah. You don't look like the type of uh, artistic lockpicker that we're looking for. You might be surprised. What? Nah. I don't think so. Clear off. Holmes, I won't be able to join you. I promised to visit a patient today. It's all right, Watson. I think that I can handle this alone.
Holmes, it's all right, What? I'd better wear a shabby hat. Holmes, it's all right. Spectacles are unpopular among thugs. I don't want to arouse suspicion. Stay where you are. What are you doing here, and where is Sherlock Holmes? Calm down, Watson. Take deep breaths now. It's me. Oh, thank God, Holmes. I can't get used to your disguises. Thank you, Watson. That means I am ready to go. Who are you? What's your name? My name is Nigel. I'm here to open the locks. Talented, eh? Let's see. Go inside the marquee and show yourself to Charles Foley. And I'd highly advise you not to trick him. Got that? I've got it. So, everything is here, just as you asked. And what about the money? Some of the barrels are wet. Transportation issues, it couldn't be out. Whatever. We'll be here after midnight to pick up the supplies. I want to be paid first. No. You'll be paid after we make the transfer, as I said. Right? I hope that no one saw you. The police are on the lookout. Of course not. I'm a professional. Glad to hear it. Be ready for tonight, then. This printing press is old, but still quite capable of printing hundreds of pages per day. Hmm. There are enough posters to paste across half of London's walls. That's a picture of a contemporary gentleman wearing a Robin Hood hat. Interesting. From lambs into lions, those are words of encouragement and defiance. This poster was clearly made to fire up rebellion amongst the people. This wooden barrel is damaged. It is difficult to say what is inside. This wooden... There is a spot on this barrel that was intentionally painted out. The crest of the Honorable Artillery Company. Could it be gunpowder? I need to be sure. Judging by the fractions and the scent, I can confirm that it is, in fact, gunpowder. The barrels are roughly clustered. It seems as though they were brought here in a hurry. Powder kegs, a printing press, and a great many blank papers. All of this was stolen by the Merry Men quite recently. And these poster samples... I am quite sure it is not a coincidence. The Merry Men 
are planning some sort of sabotage. Stop right here. Who are you? Are you Charles Foley? Maybe. They say that I can open any door. Do they now? We'll see her lock near the chains on a table over there. Open that. Well, they're right. What's your name? Nigel Shirley, from York. Ah, Nigel from York. Never heard anything about you. How'd you hear about me? It's a long story. I met your brother, Vincent the Butcher Foley, in prison. He told me all about his betrayal and all about you. Before I was released, he told me that you might find a job for me one day and pay me some money for me craft. Well, he died. Seven days ago, in prison. Hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. That's all right. The traitor has paid the blood price for it. And you'll do the job anyway, because I need a talented lock picker. I know just where to search for his legacy. It's all about the Hellenistic treasures, isn't it? Osh, you fool. Now, listen up. You'll come with us tonight, and you better mind yourself. Us? Wait, who's coming then? Billy, Jack and me. And what will I get for that? We'll share the loot. The one you seem to know about. Right. Wait for us at the abandoned manor house on a corner of Ledbrook Grove and Kensington Park Road at midnight. Deal. Here I am at the manor. Somewhere inside it are the Hellenistic treasures. This lock is quite old. It shouldn't be much of a challenge. I need to find where the safe is hidden and lock pick it. This cupboard is an absolute mess. Several books have fallen from the shelves. It seems as though this cupboard can be moved. I'll give it a try. So, that's the lock I must open tonight. Let me see. Thank you. 
what a surprise. Another lock. Hmm. And I won't be able to pick it. I recall that precious key around Foley's neck. It might prove a decent fit. I suppose they hired me to only open the first lock. Let us wait for the thieves, trap them, and find out. Let us check the thieves' possible escape routes in the event that they are caught off guard by the police from the front door. This door is a perfect means of escape in an emergency. A solid rope. This should be useful. The door is now blocked. I wonder what this old chandelier is doing on the floor. It looks as though it was poorly attached. I suppose that the thieves already tried to open the lock with this formidable hammer, but they were unsuccessful. This should be useful. Now, if anyone takes the hammer, the rope will uncoil and make the chandelier fall. If he runs through the dining room and takes a sledgehammer to force open the door, the chandelier will knock him down. The ground floor window is a perfect way to escape the police. This works very well. No one will escape through this window now. There is no ladder. If anyone falls here, he will need assistance to get out.
This should be useful. Now, it's not an open hatch, just a nice carpet on the floor. I should walk carefully here, else my plan will be ruined. Now, if a thief runs through the kitchen, he'll pay a surprise visit to the cellar. Although this window is high above the ground, it would be possible for one of the thieves to attempt to use it for their escape. This should be useful. One step on these beads, and our thief will go flying. I should walk carefully here, else my plan will be ruined. Any thief who finds his way upstairs will roll down very quickly. The traps for my circus companions are all prepared. I can leave now, but I'll return later with Charles Foley and his companions. Stop where you are! Where are they? Trapped, Watson, with your assistance. How so? You sounded just like a real Bobby, my dear fellow. You startled them into the traps. I did? I assure you, Watson, it was quite an entertaining show. They will not escape the house now. You scum! And this is the pistol used for the murder in Half Moon Street. How do you know about that? Have you closed the case yet, Sherlock? Mycroft, what are you doing here? Did you follow me? Sherlock, it may seem that I used you. But you should be pleased to know that you have served our Queen Wow, in this instance. So now, let us catch the big fish. But this man is not one of the merry men. No. Then why exactly are we here, Sherlock? This gentleman, Charles Foley, has been involved in a double murder, and the hunter of a set of valuable antiques, the Hellenistic treasures, which disappeared in a theft many years ago. You're no better than the coppers! Holmes, that is incredible. The Hellenistic treasures. Indeed. Nothing but trifles. Where are the merry men? I don't know why you are asking me, Mycroft. They are yours to find. I'll see you soon, dear brother. Charles Foley, you committed the crime of premeditated murder and of theft. You will be severely punished for your deeds. You are pitiful. 
You Scotland Yard dog! Save your words for the gallows. I am sure the journalists will love them. I shall leave now, Watson. Gentlemen, please take our friends here into custody. Where are you going? I have unfinished business. I'll see you at Baker Street. Be careful with the lamps. Don't bring them too close to the barrels. Good evening, gentlemen. Who's there? That is of no importance. What matters is who you are and the plans that you have here. <laughs> so you can stop us from carrying them out? Eventually, yes. Hey, careful. You'll blow us all up. I'm listening. We are a group known as the Merry Men. But I suppose you knew that already. We are the men who've already lost everything of value in their lives. We are ruined shopkeepers. We are workers who were fired from their jobs. Honest people who were robbed. We were forced out from our homes and thrown onto the street. And all of this in the name of the so-called law. The laws that were set out by our government. The laws that make the commoners only more vulnerable and the wealthy more protected. We are not only from the British Empire. Some of us are from the New Lands, America, Australia, and we are many. But men, we are still, and we are merry for that we stopped being afraid. For those powers that be had done their best to plant the fear inside our souls, and we accepted it so easily. The fear advised us to keep our heads bowed. It prevented us from fighting. Bankers and politicians, they own our lives, our work, our bread, and they push us to compete between each other just to see who may serve them better. But in the end, they are the few, so they are weak. They are nothing without their titles. We should not fear them. Our so-called masters should fear us instead. The time has come for our group to stand tall. Our great and many merry men. We are going to blow up the London Stock Exchange. No life shall be lost. But ownerships, debts, and property titles? They shall all be destroyed. They're only papers, after all. So many people will be freed over this night. That is a radical step to take. What result do you truly expect? Chaos. But soon people will understand that they are free, and that they don't belong to anyone. They will be able to work for themselves, together, without letting the rulers dictate what to do, and finally justice will arise. What you are intending to do is a crime. It is not justice. How do you see justice, then? Kids go to prison for a loaf of dry bread. And how many lords do you see punished for stealing from their people, sending them to their deaths in mines or overseas to fight for land? Our masters wouldn't hear us. So now it's time to sing the song of the merry men. Will you let us do our duty? When people fight the order, they are too blind to see the consequences that throw society into chaos. I shall stop your actions, but not you. Run. Now! So, you're interested in Russian literature now? Quite, lately. It is an interesting book. I remember a few lines. Really? I tried reading it myself, but I had a hard time understanding it. Yes, Doctor. It's about intelligence. Sherlock, I vaguely recall one of the lines. Sometimes it takes something more than intelligence to act intelligently. Mm. There were also a few words along the lines of Pain and suffering are always inevitable for a large intelligence and a deep heart. Mm. Tell me, Doctor, does my brother show any signs of pain or suffering? Uh, not that I know of. Because you see, Doctor, 
Behind all of his masquerade, my brother does possess a deep heart. So deep that he does not recall where he places his love. Well, I'm sure that... Uh... His love and his duty that, in the first place, should be directed towards the Empire. For without it, we would be nothing. A country filled with uncivilized men. And the Empire needs order and discipline. It has no room for chaos. People who commit crimes, or at the very least intend them, deserve punishment, Sherlock. Without justice, there can be no civilization. But we serve the truth, not justice. Your truth, Doctor, that may prove immoral. Allowing people to terrorize London, destabilizing the whole Empire. Terrorize only the powers whom you serve, Mycroft. Not I, not Watson, not Mrs. Hudson, not Wiggins. Sherlock, the merry men are to be stopped. Not by me. You created the merry men. Stop them yourself. Only make sure that you don't create ten more merry men by arresting the one. Good night, Dr. Watson. Anything in the post, Watson? Any clients worthy of our attention? Only a second reminder from Mrs. Hudson about our new neighbour. She urges you to remove your... Oh, I don't care about that. Holmes, the lady who will be moving in shortly has requested the use of our spare room to place all of her boxes. Wait, what? A... a lady? <laughs>